So welcome all those that are here in person and those that are joining us online to our first National Maternal Mental Health Summit, partnering for the wellness of racially marginalized communities. And yes, I am excited. So my name is Reverend Dr. Q English, and I'm the director of the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships at the United States Department of Health and Human Services, where the Honorable Javier Becerra serves as the secretary. So our office has five key initiatives, maternal health, youth mental health, suicide prevention, substance use disorder, inclusive of overdose prevention, and our newest toolkit has been included in your packet. And so we're gonna talk more about that later. And of course, our continued work around vaccinations and boosters. It is not over, it is not over. We still need to push the message of being vaccinated even for children five and under. And as it relates to suicide prevention, we are pleased to announce that on July 16th, 2022, the US will transition to using the 988 dialing code, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The release of 988 is more than just an easy number, easy to remember number. It's a direct connection to compassionate, accessible care and support for anyone experiencing mental health related distress. Mm -hmm. Whether that is thoughts of suicide, mental health, or substance use crisis, or any other kind of emotional distress, people can dial, also dial 988 if they are worried about a loved one who may need crisis support. This transition takes place on Saturday, July 16th. So all of you should have received the packet when you came in with valuable information. One very important document, all of it is important, but it's the call to action form that we trust you will complete and turn into one of our staffers prior to you leaving. This is how we continue the movement and we're gonna talk more about that later. So right before I introduce our co-hosts, I know some of you have Twitter accounts, so I want you to take a moment to follow us at HHS Partnership. That's HHS partnership um, and feel free to tweet. So at this time, I want to introduce our partners and co-hosts for this event. I am so grateful for our partnership. The American Psychological Association, APA, is the largest scientific and professional organization of psychologists in the United States. And we have been working together for a while and we appreciate the work they are doing in so many area that touches so many lives. So bringing today's opening remarks, let's welcome to the stage, Dr. Arthur Evans, the CEO of APA. Well, welcome everyone. Um, it, um, we are really, really honored to host this event. Um, we welcome you here to the Spire Conference Center. Um, if you uh, have any needs, we have staff who are walking around. We wanna make sure that you're comfortable, that you enjoy the view, uh, and most of all, that we leave this place really prepared to make a real difference in uh, maternal mental health uh, and all of the other issues related to maternal health. Um, the APA has been very interested and involved in these issues for a very long time. We do that through advocacy, advoca advocating on a whole range of issues from ensuring that we have an adequate workforce to making sure that issues like social determinants that we know drive mental health outcomes and other health outcomes are a part of how our nation addresses mental health to how we use research and publish research in uh, the over 90 journals that the APA publishes. 
to providing guidelines to the field, the mental health field around uh, the treatment of women. Um, so there are lots of ways that we are committed and that we want to stay engaged in this issue. Uh, and again, we're very help, very uh, grateful that you're here uh, today for this event. I want to acknowledge a few people. Uh, first of all, um, Dr. Uh, Q English, uh, who you just heard from, who is the director of the Partnership Center at the Department of Hel Health and Human Services. Um, there are very few events that are not APA events where you will get the presidential trio of this association. But this one, we have all members of our presidential trio here, and I want to recognize them. Uh, first of all, Dr. Frank Worrell. He is our current president, a scholar um, at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Dr. Um, what's your name? Um, <laughs> I, I really did just, go, my mind just went boom. I know who she is. Uh, we're really actually really good friends. Dr. Jennifer Kelly, who, <laughs> stand up Jennifer so they can see you. <laughs> There you go. Given that queen, given that queen wave, that's good. Uh, Dr. Kelly actually um, is a health psychologist, and actually during her presidential year last year, she's our past president, uh, made health equity a centerpiece of her um, her presidency. So we're very uh, glad to have her here as well. And you're going to hear from Dr. Tamer Bryant, uh, who is our president elect. So we have a powerhouse of uh, presidents, as you can see. Um, I also want to just recognize Janine Joseph, who is the CEO and founder of Common Sense Childbirth. And our partners in the Biden administration were represented by Julia Chavez Rodriguez, senior advisor and assistant to the president and director of the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Where are you? There she is. Thank you for being here. Carol Johnson, who is the Administrator of the Health uh, Resources and Services Administration, HRSA. Are you here? Okay. All right, well, we want to acknowledge her as well. Uh, and I want to make sure that we acknowledge the staff who have helped put this together I know that they work really, really hard. Uh, so if you could just give them a round of applause for supporting this event. So thank you for being here. And again, uh, we wanna make sure that you're comfortable, that you feel welcome. Uh, anything that we can do to help uh, in that today, just let us know. Thank you. So I'm honored now to introduce to you one of my closest allies in addressing the current maternal health crisis, who will set the stage for our summit today as we look at where we are, how do we get here from an historical lens. So let's welcome the president and founder of Common Sense Childbirth and Time Woman of the Year 2022, Jenny Joseph. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Getting set up. Reverend Dr. Q asked me to speak about the history of maternal health in the USA. That's a whole 15 minutes that I got for that. So stand by, <laughs> you're gonna have to go pretty quick. Um, I'm a midwife. I've been a midwife now for 40 years. I've been in the United States 32 of those 40 years. I'm still reeling. When I got here, I had no idea what was going on. And I think that when we go through this history real quick today, we'll get a sense of how we got here and why so many of us are so deeply concerned because even after all these years, these actual centuries, we're not doing so well. So let's go back. Let's start where we need to start at the beginning. And of course, we're talking about enslavement. We're talking about human beings as chattel. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> That's great, thank you. 
we're talking about the fact that along with the Africans that were brought here to be enslaved, their midwives came with them. So we look at this from a perspective of what was actually going on. And obviously the women, the people who were able to produce the commodity of human beings needed to be looked after. And so women that were in childbearing years, for example, were twice as expensive to be bought or sold because of the capacity they had to bring life. And of course, the legacy of this transatlantic slave trade continues today. The progeny were what built America. The black midwives delivered America. They delivered both black and white. The indigenous midwives obviously were already delivering indigenous peoples that continued as well. But I'm talking about midwifery in the context of maternal health, because as you all know, nowadays, midwifery is fringe. Midwifery is unusual. Midwifery is a choice. In the rest of the entire world, that's not how it is. This is the only country where midwives don't take care of the childbearing population. There's the reason for that, and the repercussions of that are clear. So one of the things that's really important here is to make the connection between the gynecological torture that led to gynecology as a discipline that we now know and understand. Enslaved women were basically used to be experimented on. Um, surgery was done, no anesthesia. Why? Because there was a belief that black people didn't feel pain in the same way. Black people were owned. They were not, they did not have autonomy or independence. We have, um, I've written the names here, Lucy, Betsy, Anaka, these three slave women were, um, you know, finally recognized for their contributions to the development of gynecological procedures from Dr. Marion Sims, who was, has still been lauded and lifted up as such an important figure in women's health. Just recently, his statue was removed from New York um, Central Park. But this is not unusual, and he was not the only one. But it's important to understand that it, without these slave women, many of these procedures would not have been perfected. The other side of this coin is important too. And just this week in the Philadelphia Inquirer, there's an article that speaks to the history of obstetrics. And obstetrics, the modern obstetrics, the systems that we use to this day were started in Philadelphia. Dr. Shippen, actually a male midwife, began teaching medical students in the first um, hospital, Pennsylvania hospital in the country and began to outline midwifery, but it turned into obstetrics. Dr. Shippen to this day is lauded and lifted up as the founder of obstetrics and as, as being able to say that all of the procedures, all of the systems that he is still recognized as the person who established that. But of course, once again, he was using black people, enslaved people, post-slavery, they used people who were poor, disenfranchised and unable to defend themselves. It wasn't until 1862 that the Freedmen's Hospital, the first hospital that attended to black people began delivering babies 
and um, in the DC area, which is now Howard University Hospital. But up till then, black people and all people were born at home. Home birth was how you were born. The Tuskegee School began a nursing program in 1892. And this was the beginning of the professionalization of nursing, of medicine. And all the while this was going on, midwives were delivering America. Oh, did it, what happened? Oh dear, I've lost my, I need some help here. <clears throat> Thank you. There we go. Yes. The internet gone, is that what happened? I haven't got a access. So I'll keep going. At the end of the day, bottom line is that what we have inherited as the systems that we are now depending on grew out of the need to move people from the hospital, from the homes and into the hospital as the midwives were essentially eradicated. And especially across the South, the African-American black midwives delivered everybody and they were known and respected. They were sought out and they safely did what they could do with the resources that they had. There were 50% of births taken place with midwives by, in 1900, but by 1935, 10%. It wasn't by accident. Midwives were eradicated on purpose. The Shepherd Towner Act of 1921 was the first time legislation was passed to address the problem of infant mortality. Also, women had the vote at this point. The unfortunate part of that was the way that they perceived to take care of the problem was to deploy white public health nurses, to create health departments, and to move the midwives out of practice so that um, doctors and hospitals could take over managing birth. And so we began to see the addressing of this so-called problem which truly wasn't any more of a problem than the fact that we have no resources to support midwives. You can see these classes of midwives who attended the institutes, they were forced to attend, they were given um, certificates, and then they were honorably discharged after they had done their training. They were unaware of the, the, the actual plan to move them out. But when we lost the midwives, when the communities lost their midwives, they also lost the safety that came with those midwives. It's a rich history and it's easy to find so many um, stories and um, uh, reports um, some of you may have heard of midwife Maud Cullen, a very famous midwife who ran clinics, who um, helped her community, not just with childbearing, but elders, everybody that knew that they needed help, knew how to find the midwives to support them. And so the trainings continued until we get to the point where the midwives, the black midwives of the South were gone. And in the 1970s, we began another movement of midwifery, home birth midwifery, mostly led by people who were in the hippie movement, who wanted independence, who had choice and power. But black midwives have always tried to prevail, to build back our communities. And towards the end of the 20th century, we were beginning a, a movement to really reclaim birth. Because in the absence of midwifery, we have what I call maternal toxicity. Mothers are in danger, wherever they are, however they are, whoever they are. And the people suffering most 
from the toxicity that is the United States when it comes to maternal health are people of color. The alarm was sounded when ProPublica made that very important series called Lost Mothers and began to highlight what was going on. They collected nearly 5,000 stories. There are tens of thousands of stories. We have to remember that it's not just the mothers that die, it's the mothers who survive. How many are surviving and not telling their story, not being recognized, invisibilized, shut down, silenced by a system that will not take the responsibility for the toxicity that surrounds them. We know Serena Williams' story, another person who has been brave enough to share her experience. And we are horrified, oh, how could this happen? Well, this is how, this is why. 50,000 or so near miss people who don't die, I would suggest that number's way off because women don't speak. It could be 250,000, it could be 500,000. We have 4 million births every year in the United States. So even though this is awful to hear, it's time to tell the truth so that we can now move forward and build from a, an approach that will actually make the difference. It's time, because at the end of the day, the only way we can learn from our history is by looking back in order to look forward. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you for enlightening and educating us to hard truths. And thank you for being such an exemplary midwife for all of us, thank you. Now we will be turning our attention to look at the psychosocial factors affecting maternal, physical, and mental health. It brings me great honor. Uh, we too have been working together in this space, serving on our think tank, this next speaker educating us at every opportunity, it's a great honor to introduce the president-elect of the American Psychological Association, Dr. Tama Bryant. Thank you so much. So good to be with all of you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. Here to be a part of the solutions. Here because we know that families matter. Here because we recognize that our lives, our mothers, our fathers, our babies, our lives do indeed matter. And so I am so grateful to be able to be here and to be a part of this partnership as we turn our attention to psychosocial factors affecting maternal, mental, and physical health. So it's important for me to name why I show up in this space. For me, it is not merely an intellectual exercise, uh, but I am also a Black mother. And the image you see there are my two children, Ife and Ayo, and those names in Yoruba mean love and joy. And I have to tell you, because I know one of our groups of partners on today are faith leaders. And when Ayo was born, my son, I was already considered a high risk pregnancy because I was 38 years old. And when he was born, he was born not breathing. And the room went silent. And the only voice in the room was my mother who was praying. And so it makes a difference for all of us to show up and do what we do. The medical team started working. My mother was doing her work and I was still in recovery, uh, still not even aware. It did not click to me that my son was not breathing until they took him out of the room. 
And once they got him breathing and stabilized, my scores went off the charts. And so then we were not able to leave because of me. And it is only because of a collaborative effort uh, that I am here today and that Io is alive. And I also recognize the many who did not make it. And so as a psychologist and also an ordained minister, I take this work very seriously. And I'm glad to be a part of the American Psychological Association, where particularly our team in advocacy has been doing this work for us to mobilize as a nation and as a psychological organization to protect the lives of our families. The most common mental health, maternal health complication is actually mental health. So often we think about the physical complications, but many persons who are pregnant deal with the realities of depression. And you'll hear more about that from my colleague, our next speaker. Also the realities of anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, substance use disorders, and postpartum psychosis, which we recognize in an environment where we are also facing the realities of racial stress and trauma can be particularly difficult to process. I had a dear friend who was hospitalized with postpartum psychosis, and she was trying to grapple with the belief that she was hospitalized and her baby was taken because she was a protester. So how we tease out psychosis in the middle of an experience when our lives are under threat. And so the realities of mental health affect not only those who are pregnant, uh, but also their partners and their children. And so one in five of women uh, suffer from maternal mental health challenges, uh, including depression. Less than 15% of those women receive treatment. Up to 50% of women living in poverty will suffer from a maternal mental health disorder. And we recognize that mental health conditions do not only affect mothers, but also fathers and also partners who are non-binary. We recognize that one in 10 dads will experience perinatal mental health disorders following the birth of the child. And so the challenges do not end with delivery. So what are some of the psychosocial risk factors that add to the risk uh, for maternal mental health conditions? One is lack of social support. And we know there are many factors that can affect the ways in which people are able to show up for you. One of them is mass incarceration. And we know that people of color are more likely to be parents while they are also incarcerated, which is a trauma to the children. Dealing with the realities of perceived stress, having prior mental health conditions even before pregnancy, a history of violence. So those who are survivors of sexual and physical violence including we recognize intimate partner violence increases during pregnancy. So I don't know if you all are aware, let me say it again. The realities of partner abuse, severe physical partner abuse actually increase during pregnancy. We also are aware of the realities of unsafe neighborhoods and also human trafficking. And we should know for domestic sex trafficking, the adolescent girls facing the highest risk are African-American girls. So we want to be mindful about what it means to be pregnant when someone is already a trauma survivor. Low self-efficacy, low self-esteem, and low self-compassion also increase the risk. And we deal with something uh, some of us call the societal trauma of oppression. And while we are aware of the societal trauma of oppression, namely racism, I want to also name classism and poverty as well. And so when you are dealing with housing and food insecurity, that makes the pregnancy even more difficult. The realities of community violence and the realities of racism, anti-Black racism, inequity, structural, interpersonal, and collective racism. The APA has passed legislation acknowledging the role of psychology 
in the realities of racism and the consequences of racism. And we're also aware that this exists within the medical field, the physical health industry as well. So some of the physical health complications, and these are seen in higher numbers, not only with black uh, pregnant individuals, but American Indian, Alaska Native, and Latinx pregnant individuals as well. Gestational diabetes, anemia, hypertension, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, preeclampsia, infection, preterm birth, low birth weight, pregnancy loss, miscarriage, stillborn, and maternal mortality. There are particular risks for maternal mortality, uh, which include high blood pressure, inadequate equipment, and some of the stories that have been shared uh, on today and that are included in the film deal with those realities of being in uh, under-resourced hospitals, lack of ambulance transportation, delay in referral services, cardiovascular conditions, hemorrhage, self-harm or unintentional harm, that's including from unsafe abortions, as well as intimate partner abuse and human trafficking, and then the realities that racially marginalized pregnant persons face, delayed or inadequate prenatal care, racial implicit biases of care providers, and this is documented where medical personnel in the present, you all heard the history, but in the present continue to believe uh, that black people don't experience pain in the same way that white people do. And so that structural racism shows up in the denial of services and it really uh, inhumane treatment. So there are increased risk for maternal death. Uh, we have heard that black women are three to four times more likely to die than white women. American Indian and Alaska Native women are two times that of white women. Most pregnancy related deaths are preventable. And so we want to be really mindful about who pays the cost by the medical neglect of our community members. And so we're here to think about solutions and all of us are a part of the solution. So I invite you to think about ways you can engage in awareness raising whether you are a part of the faith community or a health provider, uh, for us to increase training in physical and mental health care providers attending to not only trauma-informed care, but culturally informed care. And from that standpoint, we talk about a liberation model, a way that promotes health equity. We wanna look at eradicating structural racism and promoting health equity and engaging in services that are holistic, mind, body, and spirit for all of our marginalized families. We also want to look at building and strengthening interdisciplinary teams because we can accomplish more together with greater coordinated care, quality aftercare that is sustained far after delivery because the challenges continue even after the birth. And I am excited about each of our roles in advocacy, us advocating whether as pregnant families, as health providers, as faith leaders, or as professional organizations, that we are advocating for quality health care, prevention of violence, improving mental health, and ensuring access to reproductive care options. I started with IO, and I want to end with IO and tell you that I'm so glad at his school they had a Great Americans Parade and he was chosen to represent Dr. Martin Luther King. <laughs> and so by combining our efforts, our communities can breathe easier. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fema. Uh, you know, I, I wish I had bought my uh, grandkids uh, pictures as well. Our children, wonderful. This is what we're doing it for, right? So to create a better future for our children. And I, the thing that I took away as she was talking, and, and I want this to resound in you the entire time that we're here. What does it look like for me to be part of the solution? 
And everything we hear, we're going to hear stats, we're going to hear facts, but our role today is what does that holistic model of care look like? What is my role here? We got faith leaders, we got healthcare providers, we've got psychologists in the room, we've got a myriad of, of, of different um, uh, occupations. And so there's something that each one of us can do. We are that village that they need. So thank you again, Dr. Bryan. Uh, many of us know perinatal and postpartum depression has escalated in the United States. To dive deeper into this conversation, I invite to the stage also one of uh, the Partnership Center's think tank members and quite resourceful, uh, Tanya Burwell. She is the Assistant Director, Women's Portfolio for APA. Let's welcome her as she comes. Good afternoon, everyone. Please, please bear with me as I deal with my technology uh, issues here. So I'm really thankful for this opportunity to ensure that mental health is part of this critical, critical conversation regarding maternal health. I'm thankful to Dr. English for the opportunity to participate in the maternal health think tank to contribute to efforts to work collectively to impact our communities. As I stand in this room, I too have a story about maternal health difficulties. And I know that this is an issue that affects everyone regardless of what we look like. So in October of 2020, my sister delivered my beautiful nephew. As a mother of three, and this being her fourth pregnancy, she would tell you that she knew her body better than anyone. However, her pregnancy journey was filled with moments of pain, confusion, and even anger as she worked with a team that continually ignored her pain, her concerns, and as she said, just couldn't relate. On the evening of my nephew's birth, three weeks earlier than expected, my sister began to bleed excessively and called for a nurse right before losing consciousness. In her own words, she woke to doctors pounding on her chest. After receiving a blood transfusion and being monitored for a few extra days, she was okayed to go home to her partner and her three children. When she got home for weeks, she relied on her 13-year-old to take care of her younger siblings. Her partner complained about the house being a mess. She didn't want visitors to come by to see the new baby. She was so unhappy. She was anything but okay. So while Dr. Bryant has laid out the psychosocial and behavioral factors impacting maternal health and the risk factors, I'm just gonna provide a few uh, definitions of perinatal and postpartum depression that I wish were available, my sister had to be able to recognize those signs early on. <clears throat> In my brief time here, my goal is to leave you with one statement. We can't talk about maternal health without talking about mental health. So mental health issues as stated are the most common complications of pregnancy and childbirth. And while we refer to mental, maternal health and mothers and birthing individuals, I too wanna make it very clear that this is not just a women's issue, this is a whole family issue. It's also important to note that maternal health disorders can affect any individual with various identities and backgrounds, including age, race, gender identity, sexual orientation, and education. And we also, again, make note of the disparities in prevalent screening and treatment for birthing individuals of color and other marginalized communities. Okay. <laughs> so Dr. Bryan had produced an, a really nice infographic with a number of these uh, statistics here. So I'm not gonna go through them again, but I do think it's really important to keep them up here as a reminder of how important this issue is. So it's common for parents to experience the baby blues. In fact, over 80% of new parents express feeling sad, anxious, stressed, lonely, tired, weepy. I'm a parent, so I know many of you may relate to those symptoms after their baby's birth. However, for so many, these symptoms don't go away on their own. 
So what it's really important to look at is the duration of these symptoms past two or three weeks after a baby is born. And so the terms I may use, such as perinatal depression, perinatal anxiety, and perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, these are used as an inclusive way to describe the prenatal mood issues that occur during pregnancy, as well as in the postpartum phase. In recent years, there's been more awareness of postpartum mood disorders that birthing parents experience, but it's very important that we acknowledge that these issues can occur during pregnancy, that they can and do occur during pregnancy. So perinatal depression and anxiety disorders encompass the period from birth conception, excuse me, conception to birth. Perinatal mood disorders affect up to 15% of birthing individuals. In fact, approximately 33% will develop the symptoms for anxiety and depression during pregnancy. And while we see these numbers, we know that only half will actually access treatment. Birthing individuals with untreated perinatal mood disorders may continue to suffer with mental illness into the postpartum period. And as mentioned, stress is a huge factor. Stress is one of the largest contributors to perinatal anxiety. And I've listed a few here, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder. And for time's sake, I won't read all of these, but I think it's very important that we are aware of what the symptoms and warning signs look like. For example, feeling sad and depressed, a diminished interest in becoming a parent, feeling worthless or loss of increase in, or increase in eating weight. And it's important to note that not all birthing individuals will experience the same symptoms. Postpartum depression occurs after the birth of a child and encompasses the period of time between a child's birth and first birthday. PPD affects up to one in seven women, but for black women, this number is doubled. Approximately one in three women of color, excuse me, black women will experience postpartum depression. And as with perinatal depression and anxiety disorders, there is no single cause for postpartum depression. And again, I'll just list a few not finding pleasure and interest in things you used to enjoy, afraid of being alone with a baby, having trouble concentrating, not having any interest in being around family and friends. And this sounds very much like the story I shared of my sister in the beginning. And again, not all parents and birthing individuals will experience the same symptoms, but it's important to look at the duration and time that these symptoms appear. I also wanna make a note about substance-related disorders. Maternal-related drug overdose and suicide are the leading causes of postpartum death. Women with pre-existing mental health conditions are more likely to have health problems and engage in high-risk behaviors, such as substance abuse and use. Prenatal care to include early screening, assessment, monitoring, and intervention are critical. Working with a healthcare provider, all of these things are doable. Where's my next slide? Sorry. So there's help. Perinatal mood disorders are treatable. Early detection is critical. Working with a healthcare provider, midwife, doula, mental health professional, treatment solutions can include a combination of self-care, social support, talk therapy, counseling, and sometimes medication. Personal and cultural beliefs about pregnancy, parenthood, and mental health can often impact an individual's understanding of when something is wrong. Stigma surrounding the need for mental health screening and treatment and the fear of being labeled weak or an unfit parent can deter individuals from seeking help. However, it's critical for families and communities to understand the consequences when mental health conditions go untreated. For starters, these disorders can impact an individual's ability to care for their baby or themselves but there are more serious consequences. For example, premature birth and low birth weight, experiencing breastfeeding challenges, being less responsive to a baby's cues, and failure to pursue or receive medical treatment for an infant or themselves. Untreated mental health conditions can be devastating and deadly. As previously mentioned, suicide 
and drug-induced overdose are the leading causes of death in the postpartum period. <clears throat> so to achieve health equity, it's important that we acknowledge the intersection between race and ethnicity and mental health when addressing barriers to care for communities of color to include access to quality health and mental health care, daycare, transportation, financial stability, social and community supports, housing stability in um, neighborhoods, food insecurity and education. And where do we go from here? So as Dr. Evans stated earlier, APA looks forward to continued opportunities to work in partnership and on coalitions with healthcare organizations, community-based partners, to support increased screening and access to treatment, as well as the development of culturally and linguistically appropriate resources for birthing individuals and their families. And so I leave you with this quote, community, when one hurts, we all hurt. When one soars, we all soar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya, for that overview. Education is power, uh, but what's more powerful is what we do with the education that we get. So we'll continue. I'm looking forward to us continuing that conversation of what holistic model care looks like, but I'm so excited right now. And I just wanna say that I was so honored when this next individual said, thank you, uh, I've said yes to, being a part of this summit today. And I was none other than from the White House, the senior advisor and assistant to the president and director of the White House Office of Un Intergovernmental Affairs, Julie Chavez Rodriguez. Let's welcome her as she comes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that warm embrace, but more importantly, for the tremendous leadership and work here today. Um, I'd especially like to thank the leadership from the American Psychological Association to my left and right, um, and of course to HHS and the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, and really to thank all of you for your partnership and your commitment to taking bold action to improve maternal health throughout our country. Um, I think that we've heard very clearly from earlier speakers just a few things that I want to reiterate today. Um, women in our nation are dying. Before, during, and after childbirth, women in our nation are dying at a higher rate than any other developed nation in the world, and this is unacceptable. Black women are three times as likely to die from pregnancy-related complications, Native American women twice as likely to die from pregnancy-related complications, women who live in rural America where there are no maternal care facilities are about 60% more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications. And we've heard today that differences in how people are treated create significant disparities in our healthcare system. These systemic inequities can be a matter of life and death. And when women do not get the health care they need, families suffer, communities suffer, and our nation suffers. Estimates suggest that the direct and indirect cost of poor maternal health care could total more than $30 billion in a single year. $30 billion. And this is why we must invest as a nation in women's health. And we know that by investing in maternal health, we're increasing economic productivity and improving our socioeconomic outcomes for women and for their families. And that's why under President Biden and Vice President Harris's leadership, the administration is now taking critical steps towards this brighter future. The administration is committed to cutting the rates of maternal mortality and morbidity, reducing the disparities in maternal health outcomes, and improving the overall experience 
during and after pregnancy for people across our country. And this commitment is going to continue to require bold and unprecedented action through a whole of government effort. Since day one, the Biden-Harris administration has taken significant steps to address maternal health in the United States, including extending postpartum Medicaid coverage through the American Rescue Plan, And we also know the importance of listening to and learning from those who are most proximate to the issues that we're working to address. And that's why as we continue to take bold action on these issues to confront maternal mortality and morbidity, we must continue to listen to women who are pregnant, to new mothers, and to people who are experts in this field like you all today. And while we will continue to do everything that we can as an administration, we are also working with Congress to improve and expand coverage by closing the Medicaid coverage gap and working continuous Medicaid and requiring continuous Medicaid coverage for 12 months of postpartum care, as well as making significant investments included in the president's FY23 budget to reduce maternal morbidity and mortality. In addition to mobilizing congressional action, the White House has brought together over a dozen federal agencies to develop the White House blueprint for addressing maternal, the maternal health crisis. The blueprint outlines five priorities to improve maternal health and outcomes. The first is we will increase access to and coverage of comprehensive high quality maternal health services, including behavioral health services. Ensure women giving birth are heard and are decision makers in, the, in um, accountable systems of care. Advancing data collection, standardization, harmonization, transparency, and research. Expanding and diversifying the perinatal workforce. Strengthening economic and social supports for people before, during, and after pregnancy. In addition to, as I mentioned, extending postpartum coverage, investing in rural maternal health so that rural healthcare facilities will have more staff and capabilities to provide maternal care through increased funding from the expanded rural maternity and obstetric management strategies program. Additionally, providing more training on mental health during pregnancy and providing women with access to national confidential 24-hour toll-free hotlines if they are experiencing mental health challenges. Partnering with community-based organizations to ensure that additional supportive services are provided in the areas of mental health, behavioral health, as well as addiction services and substance use disorders, as we just heard, are one of the leading causes of death during postpartum putting an end to surprise billing, because that's also an issue that many face as they're dealing with um, the, uh, you know, sort of responsibilities after birth to then be saddled with the economic burden of bills that were unexpected or unwarranted during pregnancy, postpartum care and or delivery. And ensuring that more providers are trained on implicit bias as well as culturally and linguistically appropriate care so that women are listened to, respected and empowered as decision makers who know what's best for their own bodies and their own care. And through enhanced federal partnerships with state and local maternal health data collection entities, communities, hospitals and researchers to ensure that we have better access to data to analyze poor outcomes during pregnancy and make improvements to, supportive health, to support healthy pregnancies. So we are going to continue to invest in all of these efforts. We will continue to make this an important priority for the Biden-Harris administration. And we will continue to expand support and services for women, families, and communities across our country. And we're so grateful to each of you 
especially each of you on the stage for your expertise, your leadership, and you know, willingness to partner with our administration to improve care for all women, because it is going to take all of us to make real progress on this critical issue. So we are grateful for the opportunity to be here. And more importantly, we're grateful for the opportunity to serve our women and families of America. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Julie. Thank you for sharing these important updates from the Biden administration. And just thank you for carving out time to be with us today. Um, it really means um, a lot. And so we are now going to transition um, into our panel discussion and just start to begin to talk about um, these holistic model of care uh, for pregnant women. And so we're going to, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all the experts and I would like uh, Dr. Tamer Bryan to stay on the stage, President-elect APA. And now we'll introduce our panelists. Uh, Jenny Joseph will stay on the stage as well, but I'm ecstatic about introducing Heidi Murkoff, the author of What to Expect When Expectant Series. Will you join us on the stage, Heidi? Everybody knows she's got 20 million moms following her. We love you, Heidi. He's, yeah, she's a hugger. I love it. I love it. I only, I only got two sexist ones. Yeah. Oh, from a hug. okay. But it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Everybody else gets second. So. Yeah, so I'll take, the, minimum. I'll, take, I'll take the third. Okay, so we also have Chanel Portia Albert. She's the founder and CEO of Ancient Song Doula Services and Deanna uh, Waving, Dr. Deanna uh, Wathington, CEO of Common Sense Childbirth. So we have well represented, a lot of great representation here from the doula community, from the midwife community, uh, from the psychologist community, et cetera, et cetera. So can we put our hands together for this incredible panel that's going to be moderated uh, by Dr. Tama Bryant? And our panelists may take their seats. Thank you so much. So glad to continue our conversation on today. And I wanna take pause and uh, acknowledge Reverend Dr. Q English. Let's give her a big, big hand. For being our visionary and getting us all coordinate together is is one person missing not having a seat you have your okay do we need one more all right wonderful wonderful so we are thinking today about a holistic model of care for pregnant individuals and wanting to look at what are the challenges, you've heard the statistics, but really from on the ground, what are the challenges and also what are the solutions? So what's working and what's not working? And I'd like to give our panelists a minute each to just introduce themselves first and tell us a little bit about the work that you do, the vantage point in which you enter this conversation. You can hear me now. Yes. You could have heard me before because I'm actually usually quite loud. So, <laughs> hi, uh, Deanna Waddington. I serve as CEO of Common Sense Childbirth with uh, my oh, friend of about 25 years over there, the founder of Common Sense Childbirth. Um, I'm actually a public health practitioner and family physician who's been involved in 
equity work in the maternal and child health space for my entire career. So that's 40 years in public health. And um, I think you just wanted one minute on that. Yes, and that's it. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. How are you today? Ooh. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. How are you today? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, that sounded a awesome. little bit better. Like, you know, we're we're here. We're we're here to center families and ourselves and our healthcare. My name is Chanel Loren Porsche Albert. I'm the founder of Ancient Song Doula Services. We're located in Brooklyn, New York, and serve all of New York City. <laughs> we're, we also just recently opened an office in New Jersey, and so we're, we're in northern New Jersey as well. Um, I got into this work uh, based on my own birthing experience, which was a wonderful experience, um, having a Black midwife and a doula at my side, um, and wanting to um, have other individuals and pregnant people experience the same thing that I did. And so I took a doula training with one of the, the training organizations that Jenny mentioned in her presentation, the International Center for Traditional Childbearing in 2008. I had a seven week old on my chest when I did it. And it was the first time that I was centered around a group of women, of elders, right? Of individuals who were um, laying hands, who were, um, automatically scooping up my child. And I was like, what's going on here? Like, what kind of phenomenon is this? Um, and centering me in my parenting. And so um, from there, I started to take on births, but saw the ways in which um, families were criminalized at bedside, seeing children taken away from their parents, seeing how um, mothers were illegally drug tested or without their consent, seeing the ways in which systems that were supposedly used to establish to support families were used as mechanisms and tools to be able to disenfranchise them um, and put them into positions where they could not, that did not offer sustainability. And so um, I train and certify doulas. I also work on city, state, and federal policy centering around Medicaid doula reimbursement. And what does it really mean to center implementation and accountability mechanisms within institutional frameworks um, that center Black, Brown, and Indigenous people every day. And so I'm happy to be here with you all. I'm gonna pass it over to Ivy. Why, thank you. And by the way, for the record, I would have scooped up your baby too. Just saying. Anybody have a baby? I'll scoop them, I'll scoop them. Um, and I'm Heidi. And um, I got into this line of work because I got pregnant and it's a true story. Two hours before I went into labor with Emma, I delivered a proposal for a book that would help other parents sleep better at night than we had. And so I was a mom on a mission. I'm still on the mission. I'm on the mission with all of you, whether you're mom or whether you're dad or whether you are just a mother lover. Like I think all of us are here. And what I realized that first time I realized what I'm about to say is motherhood is the ultimate sisterhood. And it doesn't matter where you live, where you go in the world, what your socioeconomic, religious, racial, cultural, political, political profile too. We all share an emotional bond. We all want what's best for our babies. And that goes for every mom everywhere. So I've hugged my way through Sierra Leone, South Sudan, um, refugee camps in Syria. But the, the, what I always know and what I, I knew when we first started the What to Expect Project, which is um, why I'm here today, we know that every mom deserves this, not just certain moms, not just moms who have the resources and our challenges may be different, you know, certainly the moms I've seen deliver in, in South Sudan, very different experience than we have here. And yet we share the same experience in so many ways. And that, that was evident when I um, started the What to Expect Project because I did a, um, a, a Q and A at Rikers Island Prison and met a whole bunch of pregnant inmates. This was back in like 1990. And I realized that was my 
epiphany moment when I realized that every mom wants the best for her baby and it's Thank up you. to us to do it. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I'm Jenny Joseph. I'm the founder of Common Sense Childbirth. Our nonprofit organization has worked over the last um, nearly 30 years to make sure that every woman who deserves and wants care will not be turned away. We are working from a perspective of providing not only maternity care, but support, education, love, and compassion. And we know that every person, every single time, deserves nothing less. Our work is really justice work at this point. And we are clear that this equity lens that we're all now newly applying to these systems and these structures, that is where we have power to make the change. So at Common Sense Childbirth, we are clear about the fact that we can take one person, every person, every single time and make the difference between life and death and to, to change and eradicate racial health, class and gender disparities once and for all in the United States. Thank you. Give our panelists a big hand, beautiful. So we have talked about physical and mental health, and we're aware that a group of our partners that are in this space are also faith leaders. And so I'm just going to ask if you are from the faith community and you're here on today, if you can stand or raise your hand so we can acknowledge your presence. Yes, 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 yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I want to start with asking uh, Dr. Washington, um, how are faith-based organizations a part of uh, the birth support system and what role can, can and do they play? All right, well, um, Ginny and I are fond of referring to and, and our other colleagues, um, the community birth infrastructure, right? That's really what supports us. That's what Ginny was talking about in the history. Uh, of uh, birth in this country. And it's, it still exists, whether we're adequately reimbursed or recognized or respected, it still exists, right? And so I think our, you know, our places of faith play such a large role in that. For those of you who raised your hands and said that you were in the faith-based space, how many of your uh, organizations have what you would call a health ministry or an outreach ministry, right? You're all raising your hands again, yes. So that is where, that's where you are currently playing the role and that's where you can widen and deepen the role, right? And so, so for instance, it's Chanel, <laughs> um, who's going to go speak at uh, Geneva in a few weeks. Sorry, I'm telling her secret. Um, such a great role model for what you can do within the system by, by training and certifying doulas. Also, Alexia is here, yes. Um, within your, you know, to serve your community. They're from your community, they're culturally aligned, they understand. Um, uh, the, what we call the navigation points. You remember that phrase, a patient navigator. Um, so I think that we're already doing it and then there are just ways that we can broaden and deepen it. So I don't wanna yes, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, so important. And I, I'm wondering, you, you made reference to Chanel's work. And so Chanel, you can talk about what the range and role of uh, what a doula does and also how do people become a doula? So um, I wanna, I'm gonna speak from a community-based doula perspective because there's many different types of doulas, but I really wanna uplift what it means to be a community-based doula and to center a framework of essentially hope, right? So when we're talking about faith and we're talking about, um, we're talking about our collective consciousness, we're talking about our collective humanity, we're talking about centering community in ways that have traditionally been at the forefront of our communities every single day, right? And so what a doula is, is someone who's offering non-medical, emotional, physical support, as well as, I'm gonna add advocacy, and send, helping someone to center their bodily autonomy and their basic human rights for what does it mean for me to be able to center myself in a way that allows me to feel affirmed throughout my pregnancy, during my childbirth, during my postpartum period, realizing, and I say, postpartum is forever. And I say that as a mother of six children, right? I say that as someone who goes into communities and understands that the continuity of care that mothers are given and how we center a mother 
and their parenting experience is something that allows for us to raise our children in meaningful ways. And so as doulas, we are coming in in a historical and ancestral perspective, right? Because we have always been there, right? There has, there's been stories in the Bible. There are stories in the Quran. There are texts on walls that are written that talk about and show and to depict the ways in which we have all been centered in how birth was a community event. Right. And so the doula is coming in to fill the role that essentially has been removed. Right. Because when we when you get pregnant, right, you, you, there's somebody who's preparing meals. You have somebody who's like getting herbs together. Right. You'll have the person who's like making sure you have all the baby clothes. You, you may have that person that that grandma or that auntie who's making that quilt or that baby blanket. Right. We're starting to think about what does it mean to pick a name? and the importance of names, right? And how we center um, that, that, that meaning and that, because that, that name is the longevity of that child and that family. And so as doulas, what we're doing is, is we're bringing in our ancestral and cultural beliefs, but we're also tying that into what does it mean to birth within a framework that has um, institutionally oppressed systemically uh, black and brown bodies. Right, so we're talking about medical terminology, we're understanding how to navigate systems, we're talking about addressing the social determinants of health, right, and so what does it mean to understand the intersections of care and that it's not about just that episode of pregnancy, it's also about what's going on in their lives, right, it's about do you have equitable housing? Do you are you experiencing food insecurity? Do you have access to transportation? How long does it take for you to get from point A to point B just to go to a clinic? Oftentimes we will look up from a global scale and say, oh boy, you know, this mom had to travel five miles to get on a, on a motorcycle to get to the nearest clinic. But we don't even think about down south, how in Georgia, right, where there is a huge um, infrastructure problem when it comes to hospitals, how it's some, some parents live two to three hours away from a hospital or even in Montana. Right. And so what does it mean for when we're talking about inserting like uh, training and tradition and faith, what what training does in your congregation and in the institutions of your community is really just being an extension of what you already do. Right. We're centering our we're centering the humanity, our collective humanity, and we're getting other people to recognize it, too, because oftentimes we lose that we lose that in the process of us doing work every day, right? We're working, like, I gotta do this, I gotta work, I gotta work, I gotta work. But we forget about our human connection and how we're all interconnected with one another. And so how I choose to see you or how I choose to not see you, right? Makes a huge impact on how you see yourself, how you care for yourself and how you care for future generations. And so all, that's all that doulas are doing is reminding you of that, but then also putting a twist into it and saying, well, what does it mean for you to be accountable to the communities that you serve, right? And, and the people and making sure that infrastructure is in place and making sure we have midwives who are there, making sure that, that uh, OBGYNs are working from a cultural humility perspective right, that is really centering the patient and being an active listener, not to necessarily respond, but to be able to understand, right? And we're doing that in a way that is saying, I'm not trying to step on your toes. What I'm trying to do is really incorporate what we've been talking about for years, which is a collaborative care framework in real time. That's it. And so I could go much more into doula training and all of the things, but I'm going to pass the mic. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And hi, can I, you can I just been... say one thing about yeah. doulas? Yeah. Because um, I feel they're the missing link in maternal health care. You are. Um, and that, that every mom should have a doula by her side, but especially moms who don't have that support. And absolutely, let's work on getting them covered by Medicaid in every state. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that is right in alignment with our question for you and, and so grateful for your resource of what to expect when you're expecting. Uh, and so what would you say pregnant individuals need to know about their rights and in terms of being able to utilize their voices? Well, here's the thing, because, you know, my elevator speech would be like every mom deserves the respectful, responsive, 
empathetic, um, compassionate care she needs, empowering care she needs to deliver a healthy pregnancy and a healthy beginning and a healthy future to herself and the baby she loves. Um, and that should be true no matter where she lives, no matter what her skin color, no matter what she can afford to pay. So that would be my elevator speech. And then I would challenge myself and say, um, okay, but what are we doing? She, she can empower herself all she wants to. We heard from, from Bruce and, and from Amari how, how conscientious their partners were in their pregnancies, how invested they both were. And yet empowerment in this country will only get you so far. And it won't get you over the finish line. This is not a BIPOC problem. This is an American problem. This is a problem for all of us. And, and we need to change by, by finding solutions that work. So yeah, it's, it's great. I tell moms all the time, you know, don't let anyone pick on you. Don't let, you know, speak up, hear her. The best campaign, I think you'll all agree from, from the CDC is hear her. But it's not enough to just hear her. You have to respond. When someone summons up the strength to speak up, and you know, moms, they have to be strong, extra strong, Maybe black moms have to be extra, extra strong in their communities. And that goes for mental health and maternal health. But if nobody's paying attention to you, where have you gotten? And that's the stories that we heard. We, we spoke up, we spoke up, we spoke up. These are the stories I hear all the time. And so, you know, it, it's not a black problem. It's our problem. We have to solve it collectively. Um, and, and so, yeah, absolutely. Um, on July 20th is bump day and we are going to be calling attention to, yes, it's a day to show your beautiful bumps and celebrate healthy pregnancies, but it's also a day to stand up for your sisters because again, we're all sisters and your brothers and support healthy pregnancies for every mom. Thank you. Thank you so much all join. For, for raising that. And I want to say, as it relates to uh, addressing structural and systemic racism, the point that you're making is relevant and significant because we can't think about this issue as doing a favor for marginalized mothers, mm -mm. right? That we want to help them over there, these, you know, like poor people. But when we think about structural and systemic racism, that it does something to those who are participating in that system. Mm -hmm. It is not only dehumanizing to the marginalized, but it is dehumanizing even to the beneficiaries and the actors in that system. And so when you say it is for all of us to, to address, mm -hmm. it really is for all of us to address because it says something not only about our systems and society, but about our own humanity for this to happen and us not to be engaged in the solution. Yes. So, yeah, thank you. I uh, want to ask, uh, Jenny, if you can speak to what does it look like when we get it right, right? Yeah. <laughs> Ask the solution. Well, it's interesting that you're asking that directly after what you just said, because you laid out the main crux of this problem. This is structural and it's systemic, it's historical, obviously. And when we go forward with our work and our advocacy and our interest in bringing about that change, we have to consider that the people that need the help and support to do that change are not the marginalized, but rather the people who have the power. They need help because you're right, there's continued moral injury and struggle and shame and frustration and powerlessness on their part to change a system that is designed and is actually functioning according to how it was designed when they know it's wrong too. 
we must realign where we're putting the onus. We can't keep blaming the mothers, can't keep blaming the communities. It's great that we've got a term now, social determinants of health, that's wonderful, but how do we get those social determinants of health in the first place? It's because structurally we agree and continue and condone that they are so. Not by accident that marginalization is showing up, but it is up to us to agree that we are not going to tolerate that marginalization any longer, that structural, deeply embedded harm that clearly tells us our system is broken. Otherwise, we wouldn't be getting these statistics. These outcomes would not stand. These outcomes would not be tolerated and they would not continue. So thing, when we see things that work and we recognize how simple those things are, that makes it even more egregious. The things, for example, in our organization that work is human kindness. It doesn't cost any money, right? There is no need to put a whole budget to, could you smile when she comes in the door, greet her, look her in the eye? Could you acknowledge her? Could you look at the partner? Could you look at the children? Could you just for a minute have some humanity? That in and of itself saves lives. It sounds really just completely, you know, anti-ethical, but it actually works. When people feel welcome, they feel safe. When people feel safe, they begin to trust. When they feel trust, they will open up, they will disclose, they will share because they know that they're being heard. So we could address this from all these angles. All of them are very valid ways, but the most direct route to change is to acknowledge that both the providers, the institutions, the, the politicians, people with power need the same support to be given permission to move past this way of being. When we go overseas, we have no problem with bringing new and innovative ideas, putting the money right there and moving on with getting things done and seeing the results. There is a mission field <laughs> right in every center of town in this country. In every rural area that is completely abandoned, left to fend for themselves, completely disenfranchised. We have no need to go searching for mission fields. They're right here. And on the other side of us not doing that is what we have. Death, morbidity, misery. We're talking about psychological issues and thank goodness we are because that needs to be on the table. America is hurting. All of us. We're living in the dystopia and it's not COVID. It's longer term, it's been here. And unless we break a cycle, it will continue to stay here. If we care about each other, if we care about our future, it's time to change. And, and I just want to, <laughs> I just, and, and what Jenny's, you know, talking about is this institutional reform and accountability, right? Um, and what has oftentimes I've noticed it has happened is that where we have good policy that is put in place, where it falls short is the actual implementation. That's right. Right, the implementation and the accountability to the communities in which it was intended for is not put in place. And when you don't have those things in place, then you find yourself in a perpetual cycle of harm where, you know, where there's good intentions that end up going bad, where you have providers who continue to perpetuate the same harm. And so if we're not talking about institutional reform and account accountability, if we're not talking about what does it mean for institutions to be extensions of their communities, not just a building in a community, right? And to meet people where they are, not where we expect them to be. If we're not willing to have those conversations and we're not willing to open us, ourselves up to that level of, I, you know, I wanna even say vulnerability, right? Because I think we've also, the human condition has been, I go to work, I do my job, I leave, I go home. Uh, the only time that I show my humanity is to my own immediate family and to my close friends and loved ones, right? Or my intentional community. And so what does it mean for us to realize that our intentional community extends beyond our own personal nucleus to those other things? And when we start to realize that it becomes easier. So like, 
and the work that Jenny and all of us are doing is really like a lot of it is like provider engagement. It's about ha having conversation with, with the providers. It's about deprogramming yeah. this education that has been steeped in these ideals around race and how the body functions um, to, to get them to really realize like the trauma that they have internalized, Definitely. right? Because I don't feel like people come into the space of medicine um, to do harm. Right. You got into it because you're like, yo, I'm passionate. I want like, I want to help people. Something sparked you. You know, you maybe you was like your mom or somebody did it in your community. And you're like, oh, my God, I want to do this. Right. And then you get into it and you get into this perpetual cycle of like, wait a minute. And you question things. And then you're like, but do I have a space to speak about it? Oh, wait, maybe I don't. How is this going to jeopardize my job? But I have to think about my livelihood. And so when those things are connected to, to yeah. the other, then we, we start to chip away at our own pieces of ourselves to the point where then we don't even recognize ourselves in our job, right? Because we have this internalized trauma that's become normalized trauma, yeah. right? And normalized behavior, and then we continue to perpetuate it on others. And so it's a, it's a, it is systemic, and it has to be these pieces that are done congruently not in these silos um, in addressing things. So when we talk about doulas, yes, doulas is a, a portion of it, yeah, just, just a small, very small. I'm saying that as a doula who's been doing this for a long time, right? A small portion of it, we really have to think about the other aspects about education, institutional reform and policies. We have to think about the ways in which people are gathered together to do their work. Chanel, I want to thank you for that, for actually, because actually where I was going to jump off from, you just added another piece to that. If I could just bring, bring it um, back to sort of, you know, our faith-based institutions that are here, um, part, of, part of the way in which you can help as well is, you heard Chanel talking about the policy that is passed but not instituted, right? So we, we have a policy in our state to, you know, pay doulas and midwives through Medicaid, we don't have any oversight over that. We don't get paid. I'm, I'm just being honest, right? Yep. So it's a policy. So, so I think that the pressure that you bring to bear as institutions in your community with congregants who each individual congregate brings that power, brings that voice, brings that ability to call their legislator, that's where you can make a difference about whether or not, you know, uh, we can, well, we're going to provide the care anyway, right? As you yeah, know, yeah. we provide care. People come to us, they can pay. They can't pay. They're documented. They're not documented. We're going to take care of them. So I would say that's one of the ways. And as a person trained in that system, as a mother of four, as a woman who was, uh, who had to leave her residency in the middle because uh, of the, the things that went on in the, in the residency, that caused me to go into premature labor at 27 weeks, um, who, almost, who almost died during that process. And then with the next baby had to only take 10 days off because that's all you can have in that process. The trauma that goes through that and also trying to push back in the equity space is, is uh, you see the hair is gray, right? <laughs> so, and, and also raise my children and, 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 you know, and, and have my husband be a part of that space, integrated space. Thank you for speaking to that. But I wanted to say for the faith-based institutions, that's the other, the other um, area, that's the other issue where you really help us. For those of us who are living with Of the rest of the folks coming out, but some of us are cognizant of that. And so you help us, you help us to heal that, you help us to connect, you help us to retain our humanity and our and our faith. And so I just want to say thank you for that. So beautiful. Yes. So, so important. And I want to ask you all for each of you for our closing question when we think about sustainability, because one of the challenges is people are excited about a topic and then next month they're on to a new topic. Mm -hmm. And so you all have been in this work for a long time. Uh, so what keeps you engaged and kind of a brief uh, seed for those who are here um, of why they should stay committed and engaged in this work? Uh, um, 
I think it's just uh, a, really actually it's my it's my faith to be honest with you and the belief that that this really can be better and I know right now in this time the clouds are so dark but they were they were so dark when I when I was a kid too uh, um, you know five of our prominent leaders in this country were assassinated before I was 10 years old you know and so I and I clearly remember those instances um, very dark time but we can rise above that and you know I look at I now now the kids are grown 25 to 37 and the four grandkids and I look at them and that's I'm not just hoping within my family but I'm using that as the source of you know the work that I'm doing outside in working in my community and servicing everyone the way that I would you know treat my grandchild the way that I would treat my daughter the way that I would treat my son um, treating every family that works walks through the door that way, every family that we touch out in the community space that way. Thank you. Um, so what keeps me tied to it? Yes, is my faith. <laughs> um, within my, my faith, um, I'm told to do good and live, right? And that there's one hand to give and there's one hand to receive. And so in understanding that then you know, even the days that I get tired, the my faith and um, my drive to continue to do that is when I see families feel empowered about their moments. When I see children who I help them come into the world, and they're like, hey, and I'm like, oh my God, you talking now? Like, <laughs> you, 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 I saw you come into the world. Um, and understanding the role that uh, community, but also faith-based institutions play as a cornerstone um, to driving change. There was a time where the only place that you could go to be centered was your faith-based institution. You were going there for healthcare, you were going there for your food, you, was go you were going there for education, you were going there to strategize, you were going there to, um, it was creating social movements, right? Um, it was a place where you could congregate safely Right, in a way where you where everyone felt centered and felt held. And that is just an, what we do in our work and what I do in my work, I think is an, it's an extension of that, right? Of creating a safe space where people can be held, where they can be seen, where they can be heard, and where someone knows that you they I genuinely care. Right. Um, and, and that's it. I don't think it's it's nothing, it's nothing <laughs> deeper than that. It's just very simple. <laughs> Well, you might think I'm in it for the hugs, and that's a large part of it. That's what keeps me at the party. That's what brought me. That's what keeps me, um, right? Um, but yeah, I'm in this because I see the possibilities. I see the solutions. I think, oh, this is a no-brainer. Let's go to Congress and ask for this. Apparently, it is a brainer, or maybe it is a no-brainer, and that's our problem. But unless we keep at it we've had so many losses in in recent days we've we've been set back but that just makes me more determined and determined that we spread the word and that we activate that we don't just you know talk about this have the conversation we activate and I wish you had all heard them talk this morning um, about the importance of fathers, their loss, but also what they bring to this process. We exclude fathers. We don't invite them into the process for some reason. And this is especially true in certain communities. And it's based on stigma and, and systemic you know, cycles that we can't break, but we can and we have to. We have to. Fathers are part of the solution, a huge part of the solution. And we need dads advocating for dads, moms advocating for dads. I'm a dad advocate. I know we all are here, but we have to include them at the table and have them help us while we help them. Okay. I just feel strongly about these two. 
um, at the Common, Common Sense Childbirth, we have a division called the National Perinatal Task Force. And we consider that we're building a birthing a movement to build a more just and loving world. We figure that that's maybe the simplest route to operationalizing the structural changes that we need. And we know that we got one commodity that none of us have any shortage of, and that's love. That's the power that we can use to make the change. So I ask and encourage all of you, implore you to take your individual and um, personal feelings and apply them because not one of us doesn't have a story, doesn't have some way that they link to this issue. And in the recognition of how that affects you as a person, as a human being, that's the power of being able to take that and move forward with sharing, advocating, asking, petitioning, do whatever it is you can do inside of your power and build into your community so that we all of us are on one accord. This is about justice. This is about change. And we can do it, I think, using that one commodity. I think every movement moves that way. And this is a movement. Thank you so much to each of you. And for our faith leaders, I hope you will take from what was shared, the important role of awareness raising within your congregants, uh, the important role of advocacy and thinking holistically. Spirit, yes. Body, yes, but also mind. And so thank you so much. And thank you to each of you. We can move the podium back in the center. Uh, we do have another uh, guest that's going to speak, but before she does, we want to see if anyone in the audience has a question, a question, a question of any of the things that the panelists um, have spoken about, a question, not a statement, not a comment, but an actual question. That's what we want, if you have it. Okay. All right. Come on up. Come on up. Oh, no, okay. you can stay right where you are. Stay right where you are. We're going to bring the mic to you. He said, I'm not coming up. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Garfield Clooney. I am a maternal fetal medicine specialist in New York Yay. City. So I take care of women who have uh, uh, medical issues in pregnancy, and you can imagine what stress that is like, and also going home with a newborn and some medical challenges of your own. So I uh, happen to take care of women that have a lot of uh, mental challenges and we work with them, obviously. The one thing I, you know, this is a mental health conference. And the one thing I wanted to bring up was postpartum, we do this Edinburgh scale. And I'm wondering if that scale is really valid because as we talked about the social determinants of health, you know, when you score it at, in the hospital and then you go home, some women go home to, you know, uh, help, <laughs> let's put it that way. And some women go home to a lot of challenges and how that affects your mental health and what you actually scored on that uh, Edinburgh um, okay. scale. So I'd like to hear that. Okay, so we have Jenny Joseph that's gonna to respond to that. You just illustrated the problem. The actual screening is very valid. It's definitely a, an important screening and it works, but there's no resources on the other side. So there's the end of that. That's it. No resources, right? Even if you find the one, you know, maybe your insurance will cover, that's still not set up strong enough inside of a structure that's gonna be continual or safe. So we have nothing on the other side of the score. That's where the problems are. That's why I'm saying if we look at this systemically, we might make some progress because now we identify, now we've got Medicaid for a whole 12 months. It's a wonderful thing, except for who's the provider? Who wants to take the Medicaid? Let's just be honest. Like these are the areas where we need to unpack and get back to the table. Having the Medicaid ability doesn't mean that Medicaid is going to be reimbursed or the providers are even interested in signing up yet again for another cycle of we're not getting paid. 
We have to stay in reality. And that is the sad reality. You suffer because our systems aren't in place and we're not looking at fixing those systems. Rather, we're coming back to, well, mommy, you know, you gotta tell us, you gotta come up and expose yourself, make yourself vulnerable. And then maybe on the other end of that, nothing. And I hate to be that blunt, but I'm sorry, I felt like that's really an important point. You know what, we are really, really tight for time, but I would say to you, thank you for the work that you're doing on behalf of moms, to, you know, expecting mothers. Yes? Hi, my name is Don Rico Colden. I'm the executive director of Keystone Public Health and Spiritual Care in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And my question is, what, uh, what steps can we take to integrate or better integrate spiritual care into the practice of medicine. Dr. Deanna, I guess we should have had the panelists stay up. Sorry about that. Oh my goodness. I wish I had the answer to that. I think that would make all the difference, sir. I, I'm just gonna be honest. You know, one of the things we I, I did learn from my, one my wonderful professors is when you don't know the answer, you you need to you need to be, you know, you need to say you don't. Um, I think that we approach the education, medical education with such a sterilized view, right? And that includes that you take all of those things out. We're just starting now to really value emotional intelligence. We're really starting to look at implicit bias, but what does that mean when we still, we still are teaching our students to, to name things by race, which is not even a biological thing. It's not a biological reality. So, um, so the spiritual, the spiritual piece is even that much further away and, and would love to see that integrated. But thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Right before we are going to transition, we're going to come back to questions because I'm being sensitive to the time um, because our uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome one of health and human service agencies that is leading the charge in maternal health aggressively, the Health Resources and Services Administration, also known as HRSA. And so we have with us today the administrator, Carol Johnson, and I want to give her her time because we're a little bit over on her time and then we're going to hop back in. Is that okay? So can let's put our hands together for Administrator Carol Hersa with the Department of Health and Human Services, Hersa. Thank you. I'm so sorry to interrupt question time. I uh, was really in, uh, enjoying that. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I'm really humbled to see on the agenda that these are the closing remarks. I think I feel like there's such a robust conversation. I've heard so much uh, about today that it's hard to uh, uh, stand in the shoes of so many who have um, made such terrific uh, comments today and a lot for us all to take away. I wanna thank the Partnership Center, our, our colleagues at the Partnership Center and the American Psychological Association for hosting today's event. Um, and really, I want to thank all of you in the audience. I mean, sometimes it feels like because the news media has just discovered this issue that it's new. Um, but everyone in this room has been doing this work for years and years um, and made such a huge difference in communities across the country. And I'm so incredibly grateful to you for that. And it really opened up the opportunity for us as the Biden administration to put the policy work together to ask the policy questions. Doesn't matter, doesn't mean we have all the answers, um, but we are working on the answers um, because of the work that you all have done. Um, and I will say um, leadership matters. The vice president has said, this is an issue. This is what we have to do. Charged all of us across the government. Secretary Becerra, who's the head of the Department of Health and Human Services, has made this a priority. Charged all of us who report to him um, to take action, to take actions all day, every day, to continue to move the needle. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of those actions, but I think just as important is how um, at the top of a very long list of priorities, this is for the vice president. My agency got hundreds of millions of dollars uh, proposed in the current president's budget because the vice president fought for it. 
for this issue. So um, uh, I wanna say that again is because you all have raised your voices and made it clear that action is necessary. Uh, Secretary Becerra is working very hard with our colleagues in states across the country uh, to continue to expand Medicaid has, as has been discussed, both the 12 month postpartum uh, for um, pregnant people, but also to expand Medicaid. Uh, you know, it has been the case for a decade uh, since it passed the Affordable Care Act that there has been the opportunity for states to expand Medicaid to, to individuals of slightly higher income levels. You would never call them higher income levels, but slightly higher income levels to reach many more individuals and families. Um, there are far too many states that still haven't done that. Um, so we want to get all states to expand Medicaid and get all states to add, then add um, 12 months postpartum. Um, and we're continuing to work on those issues across the board. But as has rightly been raised, um, you can have a benefit, but unless the benefit's realized, um, it's just a nice piece of paper. And so we're also investing in the workforce and not just the traditional workforce, but you'll see in the president's budget for fiscal year 2023, the budget that Congress is currently working on, um, the president proposed significant new investments for our agency to implement, to expand community-based doulas, to expand nurse midwives, to really think differently about the workforce rather than just continuing to traditionally pay um, and train those who we've always trained before, um, but to train differently and to broaden out um, who the federal government invests in when it comes to the workforce. In addition, um, we also have proposals in our budget to further expand the work that, um, as others have raised, that's happening on social determinants of health, but with a specific focus on social determinants of maternal health. And the value, I had the opportunity to be at the first cabinet meeting focused on maternal health that the vice president put together. That table was not just us from HHS, it was um, the Secretary of Labor, it was the Secretary of Housing, it was the other parts of the federal government that need to make this a priority as well. And I'm so excited to see the enthusiasm and support that we're getting from our colleagues across government to think about this holistically and not just in a health and human services silo. In addition, we are, um, because today's focus is on mental health, I want to share a couple of other things specific to mental health. We at HRSA, so we're the Health Resources and Services Administration. We are the entity that funds all of the state maternal and child health programs, but the federal resources to states for maternal and child health. So we're the Title V agency. We also fund community health centers across the country. We work closely with rural health clinics. We fund all of what are called Title VII and Title VIII training programs for physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, for um, uh, the mental health workforce. Um, and so what we have done, um, one, is we've proposed significant new investments in the behavioral health workforce. And Congress is listening. This is a place where there's many things that you'll hear about that are stymied here in Washington, but focusing on behavioral health is a real bipartisan issue right now. And so we're very hopeful that we will get these increased resources to expand the behavioral health workforce. At the same time, the president fought in the American Rescue Plan for us to get more money for what we call the National Health Service Corps. This is the place where we're able to provide loan repayment and scholarships to health professionals in return for them practicing in high need communities. And never has that been more necessary, right? We are seeing real challenges. It's been two plus years of pandemic work. It is hard on the healthcare workforce. There are tremendous heroes out there um, who have done yeoman's work. And we need to make sure that the pipeline continues to support um, and that we continue are able to bring people into the healthcare workforce but not just anybody. We need to bring people into the workforce who reflect the communities that they're going to serve. I mean, this is what, this is what matters. What, if we learned anything from the pandemic, we had to have learned that trusted messengers matter in health outcomes. Um, and that means not just the, the um, clinician, but community health workers, peer supports, people with lived experience, doulas, 
how do we continue to think about the workforce holistically and not just at what happens between the four clinic walls? Um, and that's the charge I have given to all of our teams across HRSA for how we think about things differently going forward. Because let's be honest, right? There's systemic racism in the way we've done things to date and we need to change it. And so that's the charge that we have. That's our goal across the administration. There are many other things I could tell you about if you wanna talk about how we're really funding states to actually create unified data so that we're not like collecting information over here and collecting information over here and then pretending we know what's actually happening in communities. We actually need to put data together in a meaningful, useful, actionable way. Um, we are thinking about this from soup to nuts. We are thinking about what it's gonna take to change. Um, but, uh, but what I really want to leave you with is, you know, I think Dr. Joseph earlier said, this is about justice. This is about justice, but I hope you'll also see that this is about hope because we in this administration want to be action oriented here. So thank you all. Thank you so much for the work that you do and for the opportunity to be with you today. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna, we are going to continue, but just to tie into uh, what Carol says, I think this next person um, on the program is appropriate at this time. We talked about um, throughout the you, you were hearing conversations around uh, substance related uh, disorders, you know, and how that relates, you know, to as uh, as part of the triggers with trauma and pregnant individuals. And in your packet. We have a uh, substance use disorder toolkit. And I just wanted my staff person, uh, uh, Heidi Christensen, to take just a few minutes just to talk about that toolkit. Come on, Heidi. Give her a hand as she comes. She worked very hard. We not only have it in English, but we also have it um, in Spanish. I'm going to take less than two minutes because there's so much networking and wisdom and questions. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. So do your I thing. just want to say, for the faith leaders, especially in community level folks working with communities directly, one of the things the Partnership Center does is create tools through HHS specifically to answer like the information that community leaders need, kind of debunking the myths that they are, and also <laughs> the practical actions they can take. So this toolkit was yes. done so that communities could use it as a framework for creating the practical actions in response to recovery support and overdose addiction in their communities, including, including how they walk in awareness of maternal health and substance use. So I commend it to you. Our numbers in here, call me if you need copies because we have them available in English and Spanish for your use. Thank you, Heidi. She put a lot of work. It was actually, it was actually a rewrite. Um, and so we want to make sure that we get that in your hands. And it's actually downloadable, too. It's downloadable. So it's on our website. Okay, so let us continue. I just want to do one thing before we go back to the, some of the questions. Can you just pull out your call to action form just real quickly? Because I know some of you may have to have to tip out. Um, but we want to be sensitive to the time that we have here, but I also want to be sensitive to allowing some of the other questions to um, come forth. Okay, I also want to acknowledge my team uh, at the Partnership Center who worked incredibly hard in pulling this together. Michael Siegman, uh, we have three interns here and, and uh, Emily, where's Emily? Raise your hand. There's Michael in the back, raise your hand and Michaela. They worked very hard to, to pull this together and help us pull this together. Can we give them a hand? And in the heart absence, Susan, and where's Diamond? And Diamond was extremely instrumental. That's my staff assistant there. And so this has been incredible because of them. And so at this time, I just wanna just real quickly go through this and basically, we just need you to fill this out and give it to one of our staffers on the way out. It allows you opportunity to connect. And the one thing that we're doing different, and I know um, Alexia tried to help me with this and it was not successful for me, was we had a QR code so that you can just do your beam, beam thingy, beam it up thingy. Uh, and so, um, we didn't get that done. And you could tell I am not in that space. Um, but 
Uh, we will, we do want to connect. So what I'm saying is this is not the last opportunity, right? So in our think tank um, of maternal health, and we were saying that the next step is to have intentional webinars to keep you connected, to talk about what next step looks like. What can you do now that you've heard all of this information? That's the box I want you to check. Um, and then um, we want to be able to uh, talk, uh, share more models with you that can work in your house of worship, that can work in your community nonprofit, that can work um, in being a part of the National Perinatal Task Force. But we want to be able to create these ongoing conversations so it's not a one-off summit and everybody's taking notes and you're not doing anything with it. So we want to be able to help you implement what you've heard. I think that's the next step. Do you agree? And so that's what we're doing. So next month, we're going to start setting up these um, uh, webinars and connect you to models that have worked across the nation and to see where that best fit is. In addition, Jenny Joseph of, of Common Sense uh, Childbirth, she's committed to creating an hour long video so that you can hear all of your different options and you can determine the bucket that you fit in best. And from that bucket, you can be connected. Um, and so that's powerful. So for, thank you, Jenny, for um, agreeing to do that. So I, I just want you to make sure you take your time just to check off uh, what works for you. Um, and I lastly, and before I turn it over um, to Dr. Tamer Bryant, can we, we need you, um, let me see. Can we see all of the faith leaders stand? All the faith leaders stand. Then let's have all of the people that's in the healthcare industry stand. That's the doulas. Let's have the midwives. Let's have the, can we, do we have those that, that work with moms stand? Can we have the moms stand? Can we have mothers stand? Can we have aunties stand? Can we have cousins stand? Can we have fathers stand? Fathers? And, and, and let's see, am I missing anybody? Because I want to make sure everyone's standing up. That's what I was doing. So I want you to see yourself as that village, right? This is the village. This is the village assigned to provide care and support to expectant individuals. You are the village. There is something in each and every one of us that can contribute to uh, addressing what we're seeing on a, I don't wanna keep coming together and repeating stats year after year and seeing how it's increasing year after year because I believe there's a way that we can work together to address this uh, crisis until crisis no longer coexists with the words maternal health. Yeah. And now for closing, to be sensitive to those that have to leave, because we are gonna continue some of the questions and we are committed to that. I'm gonna ask my friend, Dr. Tamer Bryan, to give us some closing words of inspiration. Oh, thank you so much to each of you. And thank you so much, Q. As we go into close, uh, Reverend Dr. Q actually had you in the right position because we're going to close as a choir. I'm going to ask you to stand back up, choir. And I'm going to ask our two fathers, who some of us heard from earlier, if, he, if both of you would join us on the stage. So this is, I want us to close with this song that I learned in Botswana. And uh, it is a reminder to each of us that we are a part of a larger network and community. And when we work together, we can do some incredible things. I wanna acknowledge right before I teach this song, uh, the presidential trio, thank you both so much for being here. It means a lot. Yes, yes, yes. And to our CEO, to all of the APA staff, HHS staff, thank you so much. And it is by us working together that we can accomplish some incredible things. So this is a song that they sing in Botswana. I'm gonna teach the words first. And then once we get the words, I'm gonna put the mic down because then I have to show it to you and sign. 
we're going to sign because everybody is included in this family. All right. Yes. So it says, we are one family. We are one family. We are one family. And none can separate us. None can separate us. None can separate us. And so we will not be divided by bias, by racism. We will not even be divided by those who have been lost. When we think about the ancestors, that even those who are gone too soon are with us. And so we are present uh, with our faith, with our hope, with our commitments to justice. So it just goes like this. We are one family and none can separate us. None can separate us. None can separate us. We are one family and none can separate us. No, no, never. You got it? Yeah. Even with your mask on, we can hear you. Come on, Beyonce, let's go. We are one family and none can separate us. None can separate us. None can separate us. We are one family and none can separate us. No, no, never. I have to put down the mic to show the sign so y'all have to sing loud, okay? Do we have any other questions? I just wanted to be sensitive to that. Yes. If you want to. Yeah. Uh, 